The evidence problem from July of 2000 is about as difficult as evidence questions get. This is a fact pattern that tests a number of issues that many candidates are uncomfortable with. I realize I recently got done telling you how easy evidence is. Well, maybe this fact pattern is the exception that proves the rule. Have a look at the call of the question. Assume all appropriate objections were made. Was the objected to evidence in 1 through 4 properly admitted? And should the motion to strike in items 4 and 5 have been granted? Discuss. Well, we know we're dealing with evidence, but we don't get much of a chance to even guess about what the objections are based on the call of the question. We've got to take the time to actually read the fact pattern in some uh, detail. But we realize five items of evidence, we're probably going to be talking about relevance, objections, and reaching a conclusion with regard to admissibility. And in the last couple of items, reaching a conclusion with regard to whether or not the motion to strike should have been granted. Now it turns out this is an exception that proves another rule. This is a question arising out of the criminal law. And as it turns out, it's a straight evidence question. There aren't professional responsibility issues and probably more importantly, there are no crim pro issues presented. Let's go to the top of the question and have a look. Dan is arrested and charged with possession of heroin with attempt to sell, with intent to sell. And the defendant allegedly sold dope to an undercover cop. And in the opening statement, the lawyer for the defense will stand up and allege entrapment. And then we get the following items of evidence. First, we get the testimony of the patron at the bar who testifies that before the alleged sale that Dan intended to sell some baggies. Well, that's kind of interesting testimony and a little oblique also. I think we're obviously going to be dealing with hearsay, but it's a somewhat complicated and unconventional way of testing it. In paragraph three, we meet Peters, who is a woman that was working as an undercover officer. She got information that Dan was selling heroin at this bar. She says that she went to the bar a couple of nights before the arrest and that she spoke with another patron who told her that he had bought marijuana from the defendant. So it's clear that we've got a hearsay issue here and also a character issue. And I know how many of you love character evidence. Moving on, in paragraph four, we've got an email over defense objections. The de police officer testifies that she emails the defendant a message to deliver some heroin at this bar. And there is a paper copy of the message which is introduced into evidence. Well, we're dealing with a document, authentication issues and best evidence issues will be present. We'll have a look. In paragraph five, we get the defendant taking the stand. He testifies about facts that lead to entrapment and in cross-examination, he is asked over a defense objection, isn't it true that you were arrested for selling drugs in 1994? His answer, yes, but they didn't have any evidence to make the charge stick. The prosecutor moves to strike. And then we get the employer called as a character witness. This is Cal. There is a proper foundation laid and then over an objection, the lawyer asks Cal if he had an opinion about Dan's moral character. Cal answers, yes, I and everyone else who have known Dan for many years know that he always tells the truth. Motion to strike made, and then we get the call of the question again. So as usual, we are facing a question that has many issues, and our job is to organize our thoughts quickly and to finish an answer within time constraints. That's a challenge on both counts. So take a look at my outline of issues. And as usual, particularly in evidence, I suggest that a careful outline turns the actual blue book into secretary's work. If you organize yourself carefully, you will be writing as fast as you can to make sure that every detail finds a home in your answer. So with regard to item one, the testimony of Wolf about the statement of the defendant, we discuss relevance up front, then we consider hearsay. An admission is non-hearsay. And we also have the exceptions of a declaration against interest and a state of mind present intent. Ultimately, I conclude that the witness's testimony is properly admitted. 
We move on to the testimony of the police officer, her first testimony about the defendant, actually uh, about Bob, and we discuss relevance, we focus on hearsay, Again, we deal with the possible admission or declaration against interest in a slightly different context. And then we talk about character evidence. We've got specific bad acts at issue, and we consider the so-called mimic rule. I conclude this testimony should not have come in. We'll look at the analysis in a moment. With regard to the email message discussed in Roman numeral 3 of the outline, again, it seems fairly easy to establish relevance. And then the objection hearsay about the testimony itself. Moving on to the email message, as predicted, authentication and best evidence are at issue, along with hearsay, and then we reach a conclusion. Moving on to the cross-examination, and there are two parts to discuss. Isn't it true you were arrested? And yes, the answer, but they didn't have any evidence. For each of these, I talk about relevance. I discuss the objections, and then I reach a conclusion. With regard to the cross-examination, the fact that it is a leading question is something well worth talking about, even though it seems so obvious. But our job is to treat the reader like an old person that needs help across the street. Make it easy for them to see that we know what's at issue and we know what we're talking about. Finally, we reach the opinion testimony and we see a couple of objections. The one that's pretty obvious is the character issue. But also, take a more subtle look. The first objection I list is that the answer is non-responsive because the question, when you look at it carefully, really is a yes-no question about whether or not the witness has an opinion. He should have answered yes or no. And the fact that he didn't indicates that his answer is not responsive to the question. And that's a separate justification for an objection and a motion to strike the non-responsive part of the answer. That will be granted routinely. Okay, so now let's take a brief sidebar. For evidence essay purposes, it's appropriate to have a laundry list of objections in your mind. Not that you should exactly memorize those objections, but you should take a look at enough evidence essay questions to get a very clear idea about how this material is tested. And the reason is, as I keep telling you, they keep testing the same issues in the same way over and over again. And the more familiar you are with how the material has been tested in the past, the less likely it is that you'll be confused by what they do in the future. Okay, end of sidebar. Now let's have a look at the answer. As usual, I think we've pretty much covered the issues already by looking at the outline. But I've got a couple of points that I'd like to make as we consider the answer. Take a look at the first page and, once again, you'll notice I don't lead off with a lot of boilerplate about abstract principles of evidence. Again, I tell you this is one of the most foolish mistakes one can possibly make. Every word of those boilerplate introductions is not only worthless, but affirmatively dangerous, because every minute you spend writing it is a minute that you're not spending doing the real work covering the issues on these racehorse questions. So on page one, we consider Wolf's testimony about the defendant's statement. Look at what I do under relevance. I lead with the facts, and I indicate that it is logically relevant because it suggests that the defendant is guilty of the charges he is facing in his current trial. The lead objection here is hearsay, because the statement made by the defendant occurred outside of court and is being offered at trial to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Look under the objection of hearsay and notice that I incorporate the definition into my first sentence of analysis. So, again, I'm not telling you to leave the law out. I'm telling you to marry the law to the facts and to emphasize analysis. So, next, we turn to an admission. Notice, again, this time I'm leading with the law, but a very brief statement of law. Admissions by a party are deemed non-hearsay under the federal rules, and they are an exception everywhere else. Next, I focus on a declaration against interest. Here it's a declaration against penal interest, as I explain. And then I go on to indicate that the statement of the defendant also could be considered evidence of his state of mind and an indication of his present intent at the time he made the statement. These two are exceptions to the hearsay rule. So, here we see that having a laundry list of possible exceptions to hearsay is important for bar exam evidence essays.
The Conference of Bar Examiners will give you strict scrutiny on evidence issues on the multi-state. Here on the essays, we've got to be a little bit more flexible, a little more prepared to go with the flow of a question that they may present to us. In any event, with regard to Wolf's testimony, I conclude that it was properly admitted. Next, we turn uh, on to the police officer's testimony about the defendant. It is relevant because it tends to prove that the defendant is a drug dealer and therefore guilty of the drug charges that he faces in his current trial. The statement that was made by Bob to Officer Peters occurred outside of court, and thus it's hearsay. Again, you can see how I, in a, I think a rather subtle way, incorporate by reference our earlier hearsay discussion. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel under time pressure, and there's certainly no reason to give the building plans up front twice. So I do it once, and I allude to it later. The more complicated issue presented by this testimony here in item two is the character issue. And that's the second objection that I say the defendant will bring to this part of the police officer's testimony. We talk about specific bad acts because the officer's testimony is alluding to just that, a criminal act committed by the defendant that is strikingly similar to the charges that he currently faces. And specific bad acts evidence is admissible in a criminal trial to show motive, intent, etc. I insert that mimic rule into this part of the analysis, and in the end, I conclude that the testimony should not have been admitted because the prejudice is huge and the evidence doesn't have a great deal of probative value. If the prosecution thinks this guy is a pot dealer too, they should charge him with that offense and prosecute him for it. They should not be allowed to basically smear the defendant's character and make, it look, make him look like a criminal, generally speaking. And now, once again, perhaps I'm revealing my defense bias in criminal court instead of merely in civil court. Still, I would contend that my answer that this testimony should be excluded is the mainstream answer to the extent it's possible to say what the quote-unquote correct answer is. Did passing candidates read the opposite conclusion? Of course. Now we discuss the police officer's testimony and the email message. First we begin with the testimony. The officer testifies about the email message that she sent. It's relevant again, and it might also actually be relevant to the entrapment defense when you think about it. The objection that I raise first is hearsay. The problem is that the officer is testifying from her own personal knowledge, and in the end, I conclude that the testimony about the email message is admissible. Next, we move on to the message itself, and here the relevance is pretty obvious, but not so obvious that we can't get a point or two for talking about it. It's relevant because it tends to prove that the defendant is guilty and that he's a drug dealer. We talk about authentication and best evidence. Well. This was not snail mail. We don't have a real document that we can present. It was an electronic document. So although there is no physical copy, we can print one out and it can be authenticated by the officer and thus the printout becomes the best available evidence. Next we consider a hearsay objection and if you take a look at my analysis there, ultimately I conclude that the email message is properly admitted and Thus, I conclude globally about the officer's testimony at, uh, at the end of this section. Then we move on to the cross-examination of the defendant. We start off with the prosecution's first question, isn't it true that you were arrested? The prosecution here is confronting the defendant cross in cross-examination, so a leading question is permissible, as I discuss, and under relevance, basically I'm leading with the facts and I am inclined to conclude that this question is irrelevant and, again, that its probative value is a lot smaller than its prejudicial impact. I discuss the leading aspect of the question, that's certainly not a problem, and then we consider character evidence. And here, you can see that my analysis is less elaborate than the earlier character analysis. and. Ultimately, you see, I find a home for the 10-year rule with regard to the conviction. And here, we don't even have a conviction. We've got a six-year-old arrest. I think it shouldn't have been admitted. Then we move on to the answer. 
the answer is potentially relevant, but if we conclude that the question is irrelevant, the answer has to go too. But as I indicated earlier when we considered the fact pattern up front, I think that the answer is non-responsive and that the motion to strike should be granted on that basis too. Finally, we consider the opinion testimony of Cal, the employer of the defendant. Certainly it's relevant because the character of a, an alleged drug dealer is inherently at issue in a case like this. Then we focus on the objections. First, that the answer is non-responsive. And here I think the prosecution's got a winning objection. The witness should have answered yes or no. The fact that he went into this non-responsive answer is reason enough to strike the answer from the court's record. Next we consider the character evidence issue. Now here, probably it would be okay for the witness to express an opinion, but to go as far as to say specifically that the defendant always tells the truth probably is going a little bit overboard. As you see in my conclusion, I think the attorney should have been able to ask these questions as long as the answers were deemed responsive.